Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us here in Houston, Texas at the NASA Johnson Space Center. I am Gary Jordan. Uh, thanks for joining us here uh, for our media day here at the Johnson Space Center. I hope everybody's been having a good time. It's really good to see a crowd of this size out of the Johnson Space Center. Um, you'll notice that most, most of the day today has been, uh, and most of your experience, has been looking at Artemis as a whole and the future that the Artemis One mission will be uh, bringing us very soon. At this point in our media day, we're going to bring together a panel of experts to discuss the Artemis One mission in more detail. We'll discuss the mission operations, the recovery operations, the Orion capsule, uh, the European service module, and astronaut training uh, that's preparing for Artemis Two and beyond. So joining us to provide remarks and answer questions, we have here at the Johnson Space Center, uh, Rick LeBrode, lead Artemis One flight director, Judd Freeling, Artemis One ascent and entry flight director, Debbie Korth, Orion Program Deputy Manager, and Reed Wiseman, Chief Astronaut. Joining us remotely from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, we have Melissa Jones, Artemis One Recovery Director, and joining us from the European Space Agency in the Netherlands, Philippe Deleu, Orion European Service Module Program Manager. Thank you all for being here. We'll first start with a short presentation from each of our briefers before opening it, opening it up for questions. We'll be taking questions on our phone bridge as well as here in the room. For those here in the room, please raise your hand nice and high uh, so we can see you and run a microphone over to you and then ask your question once you actually have the microphone. Uh, for those on the phone, please press star one to enter into our queue uh, so we can get to you and uh, you can ask your question. Now we'll start with our experts here at the Johnson Space Center. I'll first hand it over to Rick and Judd. Go ahead, gentlemen. All right, uh, thank you, Gary. And as Gary said, uh, my name is Rick LeBrode. I'm the lead flight director for the Artemis One mission. And uh, before Judd and I start uh, with our mission overview, I just want to take a moment and thank you all for coming out today. Uh, our teams have been working extremely hard for a very, very long time to get to this point. And this is, this is very special. We're extremely excited. And we want to make sure that the, the public uh, feels our excitement and hears our story. And we realize that we rely completely on you all to do that. So thank you so much for, uh, for coming out today and, and showing interest in our, in our mission. So uh, we'll go ahead and pick up with, a, uh, with an overview of the mission. I'm going to hand over to Judd to start the first part. All right. Good morning, everybody. Let's see. Artemis One, uh, our first planned launch attempt will be August 29th uh, with planned splashdown of October the 10th. Uh, Charlie Blackwell Thompson and her team at the Launch Control Center in, uh, at Kennedy Space Center will uh, hand over the vehicle once they launch that vehicle and unleash the 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. Uh, we'll start our journey. Uh, if we could have the graphic there. Um, once, uh, once we start the liftoff uh, and the, uh, the vehicle clears the tower, uh, we'll start a roll program uh, that will bring the Orion capsule to a heads down position, much like we did in, sh in shuttle. Uh, we'll, uh, about a minute into the, to the flight, uh, we'll experience our maximum dynamic pressure, and so the, uh, the four core stage engines will throttle down for that, uh, that period. Uh, throttle back up, uh, and then uh, about two minutes into the flight, uh, the uh, solid rocket booster motor engines will expend their fuel, and they will uh, uh, detach from the core stage, uh, splash down in the Pacific, uh, cor correction, the Atlantic. Uh, we uh, continue on uh, to another uh, about three and a half minutes or so. The uh, service module uh, panels will jettison along with the uh, launch abort system, and those will expose the solar rays on the service module and the uh, capsule uh, of Orion, the, the, the uh, command module. Continuing on further uh, throughout uh, the, uh, the, the flight uh, until uh, about eight and a half minutes uh, where we will have main engine cutoff. and um, after main engine cutoff, we'll separate the core stage from the uh, combined Orion and uh, upper stage or interim control uh, upper stage, interim propulsion control upper stage. Uh, that will continue on uh, then to uh, about 18 minutes MET mission elapsed time. Uh, we'll deploy the Orion solar arrays uh, to provide power to the batteries. Uh, that'll take about 12 minutes to deploy. Uh, we'll continue on to our first uh, burn that is going to be performed by the upper stage. That's called the perigee raise maneuver. Uh, the core stage puts us in a, uh, an orbit that's a 16 nautical miles by 975 nautical mile orbit. 
so if, uh, if we did nothing at that point uh, to, to correct the, the, the perigee side or the, the small side at 16 nautical mile more orbit, uh, the whole capsule would come back uh, to the Earth, just like the core stage is going to do in the Pacific. Uh, we'll perform that uh, perigee raise maneuver to 100 nautical miles at approximately 51 minutes into the mission. Uh, the whole time, the, uh, the uh, upper stage will be in control of the stack. Uh, in the interim, it'll be doing uh, several maneuvers uh, to get to a uh, solar-friendly attitude for the Orion spacecraft. It'll also uh, do some roll maneuvers uh, to, uh, to make sure that the, uh, thermal, the, the, the whole vehicle is thermally conditioned. Uh, pressing on forward, uh, once we have uh, attained a, a safe orbit uh, with the perigee raise maneuver, we'll continue on. And our, our final maneuver by the upper stage will be the translunar injection orbit uh, maneuver uh, by the upper stage. That will be at approximately an hour and uh, 20, 30 minutes into the flight. That will be about an 18-minute burn uh, and will send us all the way to the moon uh, approximately a quarter million miles away. And uh, once, uh, once we completed the, the translunar injection uh, maneuver, uh, and uh, separate the upper stage from the Orion spacecraft, uh, then my team will hand over to Rick and uh, he'll, he'll start the majority of the mission there. So Rick, you want to talk about that? All right, then if we could go to the next chart, please. So there's really no time to catch our breath. We really hit the ground running. Um, as you'll see on this first chart, um, uh, after we separate from the upper stage, uh, it actually does a disposal burn, which sends it on a trajectory to the, to the moon, a heliocentric, which is it'll swing around the moon and then head towards the sun. Um, and on its way to the moon, it actually uh, will be deploying a handful of t 10 uh, CubeSats, their secondary payloads. We have no interaction with those secondary payloads. Uh, the only thing we're concerned with is their initial trajectories, um, where they're being deployed, so we can do a, uh, an assessment on, on a potential recontact. Uh, everything should go nominal when there's no concern, but we, we need to make sure that their trajectory is what we expect. So um, with that, uh, I want to I want to I want to get away from this chart. Let's go to the next chart. Uh, we'll take off the ICPS piece of it. So. Uh, <laughs> It's, I'm going to talk through a lot of this. You know, it's 42 days, and I'm going to try and do it in a, just a handful of minutes. So um, by all means, there will be plenty of time to ask questions after, after we're all finished here. Um, so uh, I said we hit that first day. We hit the ground running. Uh, one of the first things we're going to do is a, uh, we have to do a, a test of our guidance and navigation control system. There's a set of gains that are used, um, and, and the way they fire the thrusters uh, in our normal um, uh, attitude control and we need to make sure those gains are set such that we don't damage our solar arrays. So we're going to be doing that right after. That's one of the first things we do once we, once we separate. And then we're also on that first day going to do um, uh, the first of a, a handful of um, outboard trajectory correction burns. And this very first one, we're going to actually be checking out the um, uh, orbital maneuvering system. It's the big engine that we'll be using. Um, we want to check that out. Uh, because that's the big burn. Uh, that's the engine we're going to use when we do the big burn on the out, uh, outbound powered flyby as we go by the moon, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, shortly. But uh, that first that first burn, like I said, it's a checkout. It also will get us uh, moving ahead of the upper stage and those satellites. So we should get to the moon somewhere on the order of two and a half hours before before the satellites and the upper stage do. So there's no. That's why there's no really concern of uh, of recontact. So. On our way to the moon, um, like I said, we'll be doing a, a series of these outbound trajectory corrections. They're very small, uh, or at least they're designed to be small. If we end up having dispersions because a burn didn't go as planned, then we'll make it up in a, in a subsequent burn. Uh, I think we have, a, we have four of those on the way to the moon, and those all set us up for what I said is the outbound powered flyby. That's the big burn that will we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, actually move Orion, then I'll send it up to uh, the distant retrograde orbit. So when we do that burn and we go by the by the moon, we're going to be about 60 miles off the surface of the of the of the moon. It's going to be spectacular. Um, we'll be holding our breath. But yeah. Um, and to that note, uh, when we actually that burn actually executes, it, uh, Orion will be on the other side of the moon, and we won't have we won't have time with it. So we'll be praying and holding our breath, um, but uh, confident that uh, all will go well. So after that burn, like I said, it sends us up to the uh, distant retrograde orbit. Um, a couple days uh, after that burn, we will do what we call an insertion burn. It's a, a distant retrograde 
uh, orbit insertion. Uh, we'll also use that big, that big engine, the Ohms engine, to enter uh, the district retrograde orbit. And then once we're in the uh, district re retrograde orbit, we're going to spend um, we're going to spend a little over two weeks there. Uh, you've heard us talk about long class missions and short class missions. The only difference in those two types of missions are the length of stay in the distant retrograde orbit. For a, a short class mission, we just do a half a lap, and then we head back towards the moon. Um, for the long class, we do a full lap and a half, and it's a little over, over two weeks. Uh, while we're in the distant retrograde orbit, we'll be, um, uh, we'll be doing what we call orbit maintenance burns. They're small burns just to keep our, our orbit uh, in sync. Um, we'll do that over the course of the next two weeks, and then we'll do uh, what we call a distant retrograde departure burn. It's another large burn uh, that uses the Ohms engine, and that'll send us back to the, back to the moon. And um, on our way back, now we're doing what we call uh, return uh, trajectory corrections, RTCs. And we'll do a series of those all the way back to, the, back to Earth. Um, so we have a couple of those, then that sets us up for um, the return power flyby. That is our most critical burn of the mission. If, if something happens with that one and we don't execute it, then it's a loss of, of the Ryan capsule. We have to do that one. Um, but we're, we, we, we plan accordingly. We have down mode capabilities, and we can talk about that if you have questions. But uh, so we do the, the RPF, which actually sets up the entry interface. That's the, the area where we, when we enter the atmosphere uh, several days later and sets up our, our splashdown uh, off the coast of California. Uh, on the return trip back to the, back to the Earth, uh, we do a series of these uh, correction burns that I talked about, and it's all to make sure that we hit that entry interface uh, target uh, as designed. And, um, you know, I, I've gone through the mission very quickly. Uh, just so you know, on those days, those, those days where we're coasting the moon, we're doing a lot of, a lot of uh, activities. We're doing a lot of developmental flight test objectives to just basically test out the onboard systems. Uh, we're doing a, a public affairs outreach event every day where we maybe maneuver, do a selfie of Orion with the moon in the background or the, or the <laughs> Earth in the background. Um, we'll, on some days, we're going to try and catch the Earth rise. That's a spectacular uh, image. Uh, there's a couple milestones throughout the mission uh, where we actually enter the sphere of influence of the lunar, you know, where the lunar gravity really starts taking effect. Uh, that's a milestone that we'll try to capture in a public affairs imagery. Um, when we get to the point where we're actually the furthest away that uh, any human-rated spacecraft's ever been, further than any of the Apollo vehicles went, we'll, we'll, we, we want to capture that uh, in a public affairs event. Uh, so, th so we'll be busy the whole mission. Um, I went over it really quick, but uh, yeah. So once we get back to uh, back to to Earth, we do RTC six, which sets up that entry interface, and then I hand it back to Judd to take you through the the rest of the mission. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, as Rick mentioned, that uh, return power flyby uh, maneuver is, is essentially our deorbit burn. That's way back at the moon. Uh, it's about a week before uh, we enter the Earth, Earth's atmosphere. So uh, what's uh, about 20 minutes before we enter the Earth's atmosphere, the entry interface, uh, we'll separate. And you can go to the, the uh, slide there that we have. Uh, next slide. We'll separate the uh, command module from the service module. Uh, and, uh, and once we uh, perform that, we'll get into the proper orientation. We'll put the... Uh, the um, uh, uh, command module and the proper orientation for entry. Uh, we'll do a little bit of a set burn uh, prior, uh, after the, uh, the uh, command module and service module separation. Uh, that's to shallow out the angle uh, that the, uh, the command module is entering. Uh, so it's just, uh, just provides a little bit more separation from the service module, which is going to dispose in the, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we'll uh, start our entry interface, and we're actually doing uh, what's called a skip entry profile. So we'll, uh, we'll hit entry interface at uh, 400,000 feet, and then uh, we'll immediately start to control the lift vector of the capsule uh, such that we, uh, we dip a little bit in the atmosphere and then we come uh, back up uh, out of the atmosphere a bit uh, and then come back in. So we'll have two uh, blackout periods of calm uh, that, uh, that due to the, the plasma heating of the, uh, of the uh, capsule. Uh, once we get out of that second period, uh, we will uh, continue to our journey towards uh, our splashdown site, which is going to be in San Diego, uh, off the coast of San Diego. Um, we have the, uh, the uh, four bay cover jettison. Actually, I think the, the next slide is a little better picture to show you the sequence. Uh, once we get a little further down in, in the end of the atmosphere, uh, about 30,000 30, 
5,000 feet are four big cover uh, jettisons that brings out the uh, drogue chutes. Uh, and those drogue chutes de deploy around 24,000 feet, uh, followed by uh, the, uh, the mains at uh, about 6,800 feet and between 6,800 and, and uh, 5,600 feet. Uh, and then we'll uh, continue on down to 1,500 feet uh, where the uh, Orion capsule will do a landing reorientation um, maneuver such that it'll roll the capsule so that uh, we're, we're going to hit the, uh, the waves of the, of the ocean at the proper angle. Uh, let's see, and once we splash down, uh, we'll, uh, we'll leave the vehicle powered for about two hours, and we're going to do some testing there, uh, thermal testing to make sure that we have adequate cooling uh, for astronauts when, uh, when we do eventually have them uh, on board and, and are waiting uh, to be picked up by the recovery crew. Uh, and uh, then uh, after that two-hour period, uh, we will power down the vehicle, and we'll hand over the vehicle to Melissa Jones and her team, the, the recovery team uh, that's, uh, that's there on, on the, a Navy boat. So with that, Gary, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Judd. Thank you, Rick. Uh, a 42-day mission in 15 minutes. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Uh, thanks for the detailed mission overview. Let's go over to Debbie Korth to talk about the Orion spacecraft. Okay. Uh, good morning, and thank you guys for being here. It's great to see this room full of people and see all the excitement about this mission. Um, very exciting time for NASA, very exciting time for Orion. I've uh, been working on this for a long time and really looking forward to where we're going to go on this mission just 24 days from now, headed back to the moon. So it's just amazing. Um, so let's go to the next uh, animation. We've got some uh, graphic here to kind of explain the, the pieces of the Orion crew mod, uh, the Orion vehicle. It's made up of three main elements. Um, is there an animation that we can show? Yeah, let's see. There we go. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so made up of three main modules, uh, the crew module, the launch abort system, and the service module. So um, you've heard the crew module also referred to as the command module. That's that silver capsule there in the center. Um, the silver surfaces you see are our back shells. Um, it's made of about 1,300 silica tiles, very similar to what we flew on the bottom of the shuttle during the shuttle days. Um, and it's covered in some paint and some psyox tape and uh, aluminum tape to help with thermal protection. Um, so that's uh, kind of what you see there on the outside. Um, on the bottom of the crew module, you'll, you'll see um, the uh, heat shield that we've talked about being one of our primary test objectives on this slide. It's 16 and a half uh, feet in diameter, so it's the biggest heat shield we've ever built. It ablates some material away as we re-enter. Um, the crew module also has its own small uh, propulsion system. It's got uh, several reaction control system jets that perform those type of maneuvers that Rick alluded to on the re-entry um, when we have to orient to the right um, orientation before landing. Uh, parachutes, 11 total parachutes that you just saw pictures of that deploy in a very sequent, uh, time sequence to slow the vehicle down from about uh, 350 miles per hour down to less than 20 when we hit the water, um, which Reed will be happy that we're at that speed hitting the water. <laughs> um, pyrotechnics throughout the, ve uh, the vehicle, we talk about you know jettisoning things like the launch abort system or the service module when we're done with it. Uh, we use these pyrotechnic devices that help uh, separate, make those vehicle separations. And then when you go inside the cabin, you've got your environmental control and life support system. So everything that controls pressure, temperature, and humidity inside the, the volume. Um, that crew module is designed to hold four crew members for 21 days. And so obviously on Artemis One, we're flying uncrewed. This is our test flight. So expect to learn a whole lot about how all these systems work. Um, inside the, the vehicle also, there's uh, avionic systems, our guidance, navigation, and control uh, communication systems, which are a lot different than you know, the, the GPS you probably used your map to get here today. It uh, doesn't work outside of the distances we're going, so we're using a deep space network kind of um, a system for our communications. And then several uh, payloads that we're flying on this flight, um, one, uh, several of which are in the crew seat location. So we won't be flying crew, we'll be flying some mannequins and some torsos that are simulated human tissue and organs that are looking at radiation protection, radiation environment, the acceleration of the, the vehicle and how that affects the human body because our goal is for the crewed flight on Artemis II. Um, for future crewed flights, uh, won't be on this mission, but we'll be adding in a, a uh, waste management system, a galley, and exercise equipment all for, for crew health and, and uh, comfort and safety during the mission. So we can go to the next slide. So this is the, um, the, the crew module and the service module um, located in our factory at the ONC. This is before we installed the launch abort system. Um, so uh, you know, Artemis One, as you know, we're testing all these systems and capabilities, and this will be the kind of configuration of the vehicle that will be available mostly during the, the mission that we're talking. Um, one of the main objectives you've heard is about the heat shield, and so the heat shield is um, 
the, the vehicle comes back at about 25,000 miles per hour, and we end up at temperatures at about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about half the, the, the um, temperature of the surface of the sun. So we're talking about very high temperatures we're trying to protect for. Um, so uh, we, we have a block design for the seat shield. It's made up of these Avco blocks that are adhered to, the, to a skin and a skeleton, and we'll be testing that as one of the main objectives. But of course, you know, when you look at the spacecraft, we talked about some of the other objectives as well. And you can see the solar arrays here folded up against the vehicle. Um, we'll be doing what's called the modal survey of those solar arrays once they're deployed and looking at how they respond to different jet firings, engine firings, to make sure they can handle the vibrations and the loads that they'll see throughout the mission profile. Um, checking out all of our guidance and navigation and control, and then obviously the parachute systems as we come back in. Um, okay, next slide. So uh, next picture is the, the vehicle as it uh, came into the vehicle or the vertical assembly building there at KSC. So it looks a lot different now. We've got the fairings around the crew module and service module, and we've got the launch abort system mounted on top. So the launch abort system, I uh, didn't talk about that previously. It's uh, designed to pull the crew capsule away in case there is an emergency on either the launch pad or during the ascent phase. So it's uh, made up of three solid rocket motors. The, the first is the abort motor, and that's what actually pulls the crew member away. Um, very powerful. It goes from zero to 400 miles per hour in two seconds. So we're talking very quick, trying to, you know, really trying to outrun an SLS that might be having an issue during launch. Um, at the top of the SL, of the top of the last system is the attitude control motor, and that's what's used at once it is separated from the, the hazardous event. It steers the, the crew module away and, and allows it to get to a safe location. And then finally, the jettison motor, which would jettison the launch abort system from the crew module. So on Artemis 1, that jettison motor is the only active motor. We don't plan on using the other functions. This is a non-crew flight, so we didn't uh, put those motors on the vehicle. But the jettison motor is the one that works every flight. So it's either, you know, eventually you take the last off, whether you're in a nominal flight or in an emergency situation. Um, okay, I think we can, uh, let's see. We can go to the next slide. So this is a picture of us rolling out to the pad for one of the wet dress rehearsals. You know, before we got to this point, um, every component, every system, every module on the spacecraft has been thoroughly tested. Uh, we've done over 48 um, engine tests between the aux engines and the main engine that we talked about to make sure we have a robust propulsion system. Uh, that parachute system that we showed, 25 different drop tests that we did, you know, chunking capsules and lawn darts out the back of um, uh, military aircraft, making sure that we can handle every parameter, things like shoots out or different wind conditions, wave conditions, um, looking at all of that through that test program. Um, literally thousands of hours of avionics and software testing in the laboratories here at JSC and at Denver, where our, our Lockheed Martin prime contractor is located. And then we took the entire spacecraft to a thermal vacuum chamber um, at, up at uh, Glenn Research Center, the Armstrong Test Facility, and it spent over 47 days in that chamber, just really wringing it out, uh, testing every aspect of the temperatures that we'll see, the vacuum, the pressures, uh, acoustics, and so really have, have spent a lot of time testing this at the component and module level. Um, if you've been following uh, Artemis for a while, you also know we did three flight tests. We've done two complete flight test of our launch abort system. So one was a pad abort one, which was looking at performance from a pad escape, and one was the ascent abort two, which was uh, looking at it during that very dynamic phase of the ascent. And then finally, we had our um, exploration flight test one that happened um, several, a few years ago that tested out most of the crew module systems, and obviously we've added things today, and then we've also added our service module. Um, okay, I think we can go to the next slide. So here we are on the pad. This is our, the last picture we took before we rolled back into the VAB, and I just love this photo. You know, it gives me chills to see this um, moon in the background, our destination sort of calling to us. Um, just a huge amount of collaboration, testing, and energy and effort that's gone into putting this together. Um, you know, we've had over, I mean, I'd say three to 4,000 suppliers in every, every state of the United States. So really just a huge effort across our country. Um, also have a very strong partnership with our Europeans on the Euro European service module. So I didn't talk a lot about the service module. Um, our, our Philippe Delou, who's the, the manager of the service module program, is online, so I'll be handing over to him to let him talk through the details there. But, um, you know, we're, we're rolling out on the 18th and just looking forward to this flight and, and um, everything that we'll be learning from it. So, Philippe, if you'd like to talk through the service module, um, that would be great. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Debbie. So uh, we also at the European Space Agency 
are very excited about this upcoming mission, uh, which will be, uh, let's see, coming with uh, after 10 years we started this program. The Sorry, I have a blank. Yes, so um, I would have loved to be in Johnson in person uh, in order to uh, take this media event, but I'm taking it here from uh, the research center at the European Space Agency here in Holland in the mission room that our engineer will use here to support the mission. This is in addition to the team that will be in Kennedy. Can I see the next slide, please? So as Debbie said, uh, the service module is one part of the Orion vehicle. And uh, we're extremely proud at, at ESA that uh, NASA has trusted us and our industry to provide critical function to the Orion vehicle. Those critical functions are the propulsion, the thermal control system, the uh, power generation, and the storage of consumable for the crew. So the service module has 33 engine, uh, one main engine, uh, which is an engine uh, recovered from the shuttle. This is the orbital maneuvering system of the shuttle. Uh, and then eight auxiliary engine. Those eight auxiliary engine are also a backup in case of anomaly of the main engine and 24 engine for uh, the attitude control and uh, uh, attitude correction uh, during the mission. The propulsion system also includes uh, propellant tanks, uh, we can store 8.4, 8.6, sorry, tons of propellant and the pressurization system. Now moving to the turbo control system, this is a fluid loop, uh, a fluid loop where a pump is pumping fluid uh, and distributing this fluid uh, within the ESM. The main, one of the main function of this fluid loop is to reject the heat from the service module, uh, avionics equipment, but also from the crew module in order to keep uh, a comfortable environment for the crew. The next function is the power generation. Uh, this is, of course, provided by the solar panels. Uh, those solar panels provide 11 kilowatts of uh, power. Uh, this is, it provides basically in an hour more than you need uh, in order to uh, supply the need of a home for, for over a day. Uh, so, in addition to the solar panel, uh, there is uh, a power conditioning system in order to condition the, the power and distribute it to the service module, but also to the crew module. And uh, finally, the, the last system is the crew consumable. In the future uh, version of the service module for the Artemis 2 Mission Plus, uh, this will provide water, uh, oxygen, and nitrogen. Uh, for this, this Artemis 1 mission, uh, we will only know, load sorry, uh, nitrogen in the tank. There will be no oxygen tank, and the water tank will be empty. Next slide. So this is another picture uh, than the one uh, showed by Debbie. Uh, it's a bit earlier in the integration phase and Kennedy, uh, so it, it was not already mounted on the uh, spacecraft adapter and the solar area were not there. Um, so it was just uh, right after uh, the mating of the crew module to the service module. So this is Artemis 1 or Ari, the Orion for Artemis 1. The service module for that uh, vehicle was delivered in 2018. The service module for Artemis 2 has also been delivered and is now in Kennedy under integration. It's been delivered last year in 2021. Right now, the third service module is being built in Bayman and will be delivered to Kennedy in 2023. 
And then the service module for ESM429 will follow with a yearly cadence from there on. Next slide. So this is a picture that uh, has been already presented, uh, and here I will emphasize a bit more on what will happen for the service module. Uh, I will not insist on the propulsion. I think the propulsion has already been very well described by my predecessor. Um, the, uh, I presented four functions of this, the, the service module. Those four functions will be verified once on orbit. Uh, for example, for the thermal system, we will check out that everything is functioning uh, nominally. Uh, we will also verify that our prediction of uh, the thermal uh, behavior of the vehicle is as expected, or whether they are things that we did not predict properly and will need to adapt or correct to validate our prediction. Same thing for the power system. Um, one feature which is unusual on the spacecraft is that the survey has two gimbal axes. Uh, so not only you can track the sun uh, by rotating the survey on their axis, which is usually what other spacecraft do, but also you can count the survey forward and backwards. And this is needed for two reasons. One reason is during the big burns, because structurally the solar rays would not be able to withstand the loads if they are uh, at 90 degree of the service module. Um, but second, it allows to have a better tracking of the sun when the vehicle needs to have a specific attitude, for instance, when the vehicle will be approaching the gateway. Um, also, as I told you, uh, we will have nitrogen on board, and the reason why we will have nitrogen on board is because there is a major verification to be made, is that in case of a depress, accidental depress uh, of the crew module for any reason, uh, we want to check that we are able to repress the, the vehicle with nitrogen uh, that is stored on the service module. And uh, Yes, once we've completed the, the mission, uh, the service module will separate and unfortunately will burn in re-entry in the atmosphere and uh, will fall in small pieces of dust in the South Pacific Ocean. And that concludes my presentation, my short presentation of the service module, the European service module. And now I will hand over to Gary. Thank you very much, Philippe, and to Debbie as well for giving us insight into the uh, Orion spacecraft and the uh, European service module. So we've taken a look at the mission profile. We've taken a look at the spacecraft. Let's now go over to Melissa Jones over at the Kennedy Space Center to take a look at recovery operations. Melissa. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure today to be here to talk to you about the recovery operations that we're going to do in order to recover this Artemis One Orion capsule. For the past several years, the team based here at Kennedy Space Center have been working with the U.S. Navy to refine, uh, to create, refine, and practice our recovery operations to get the capsule back um, when it lands um, for Artemis One. Just last fall, we completed our final test called Underway Recovery Test 9 aboard the USS Mirtha, and that certified us to do these recovery um, operations. These recovery tests um, allow us to um, experience life aboard a Navy vessel for uh, six to eight days as we are practicing with a full-size Orion mock-up. Um, and we practice over and over again um, what will happen on splash day to refine um, how we work with the capsule and integrate with the Navy. We have a decades-long partnership NASA does with the Navy, as I'm sure you know from our time with Apollo, um, recovering human spaceflight missions, and this Artemis program will just build on that experience that we have with them. So speaking of that, so NASA chose the um, Navy, Navy's um, LPD landing platform dock class ship specifically because of the well deck that it has, the helicopter pad, its onboard medical facilities, and the communication capabilities. You can see a picture of it on the screen. Um, 
This class of ship also provides us the communication um, assets that we need to communicate back with the flight control team uh, at JSC. Uh, you heard Judd talk about it earlier. So on recovery day, we will be in communication with his team, um, listening for burns as they happen and information that will allow us to know what are we going to get when the capsule lands from a health and status perspective. Um, during the mission, the capsule will travel uh, about 25,000 miles an hour before slowing to 300 miles an hour after entering the Earth's atmosphere. And when the parachutes deploy, we're expecting it to slow to about 20 miles an hour before it glides into the Pacific, or we'll go get it. Um, and that landing location is approximately 50 to 60 nautical miles off the coast of California. Um, during the final hours of the mission, what we do to prepare um, while the capsule is getting ready to come back through entry is um, we deploy some helicopters off of the flight deck of the ship. We talked about that and some divers. So if we can pull up the first slide, um, we'll have a picture of the divers interacting with the capsule. But basically, those folks need to be in the open water and the air because we're trying to get as much data collected as we can upon entry. So we want to see the parachutes, we want to take imagery, we need temperatures, um, how is the TPS performing. And so it's very important that we already are deployed so that we can get that information as quickly as possible. And then the deployed team of divers is pictured on your screen. The very first task that they will have is trying to get to the jettison hardware that was mentioned before it sinks. There's a forward bay cover that comes off of the top of the capsule. Judd talked about that earlier. And three main parachutes. Those are the top priorities we have for getting back as quickly as possible um, that hardware. Now, of course, if we can get back drogue chutes or any of the other um, parachutes, we will absolutely try to do that. But those are our priorities. And while that's happening, there will be some tests happening on the Ryan vehicle that were mentioned for cooling and, and other things. So we let the, that capsule sit powered up for a while while we're focusing on jettison hardware. Um, and so you can see once we're ready to um, recover the capsule, the divers will approach the capsule, which is in the picture that you're looking at. They will attach something called a pony collar, which is that, that colorful black and yellow and red and orange uh, collar around it. And that allows us to attach lines to the capsule so that we can tow the capsule into the back of the ship into what's called the well deck. So if you want to go to the next picture. You can see that all of the lines are attached and we now have um, a, a ship that it, the picture is actually being taken from a rib, uh, which is a, a, re -in, um, a rigid hull inflatable boat where the, the, the Navy is holding the capsule from the back and there are lines being attached to the front from the ship. And then we will tow that capsule into the well deck where we will um, hold it steady while the Navy drains the well deck. If you want to go to the final picture, you can see a copy of what it looks like inside, a picture of what it looks like inside. Um, and you can see there's a lot of water in the well deck. We flood it, they, the Navy floods it. They drop the stern gate, pump a bunch of water in there. That allows us to pull the capsule in. And then in the front corner of the screen, you can see the yellow there. That's um, underwater, but that's the Orion Recovery Cradle Assembly and we will um, hold the capsule steady with those lines while the Navy pumps all the water out of the well deck and uh, softly land the capsule in that um, cradle. This um, whole timeline will be probably four to five hours long, which is a lot longer than it will be for crew, but this objective for this first mission is data collection and engineering data that will allow us to fly crew on Artemis II, and so we are very careful with all the TPS, the heat shield, all of the things that the Orion program needs to do to look at this capsule to say, yes, we think we can fly crew on the next one. Um, I think that's probably enough data for now. Or, um, I'm sure we'll get into some more details during the question and answer period. I'm going to hand it back over to Houston at this time. All right. Thank you very much, Melissa. Now you're seeing an, an, the Artemis One mission from end to end. It's testing the Orion spacecraft that will eventually carry humans to and from the moon, and those humans are uh, training as we speak. So uh, we'll, to talk about the humans that will make the, that journey, let's go over to Reed Wiseman. Hey, thanks, Gary. Uh, thanks, everybody. Like, this is unbelievably exciting to look at the Artemis One mission in so much detail. Um, obviously, we don't have crew on the first flight, but we have 42 active astronauts uh, here at Houston, 10 astronaut candidates, and we'll be beating down the door for Artemis Two and beyond. Um, when we think about Artemis, we focus a lot on the moon, but I just want everybody in the room and everybody watching to remember, our sights are not set on the moon. Our sights are set clearly on Mars. 
And everything that you're thinking about today, everything that we're going to do on Artemis 1, Artemis 1 leads to Artemis 2, which leads to Artemis 3, when we hope to have humans on the surface of the moon. But Artemis 3 is leading to the rest of the Artemis program. Uh, the first woman, the first person of color on the surface of the moon, and then the first humans tracking out to Mars and putting our footsteps in building science laboratories and, and inhabiting another, another planet. To me, it's just the most awe-inspiring moment that we have had here at NASA, and I, I love working here right now. It's, it's an honor to get to do so. So what are our uh, 42 active and 10 astronaut candidates doing right now uh, to prepare for all of this? I have just a few very quick slides. Uh, far less detail than, uh, than my NASA counterparts here and my, and my European friends there, Philippe. Uh, but in order to land on the moon, in order to land on Mars, uh, we're going to come down pretty much vertically, um, whether it's SpaceX Option A, building their human lander for, for the moon that we will fly, or our other contractors that are coming online to take subsequent missions, we're, we're almost certainly going to come down vertically. So we're spending a little time right now with the Army just to get familiar with landing vertically landing in snow, what does it look like to be whited out like you would be on the surface of Mars or on the surface of the moon? And uh, just a few hours in helicopters, but it is amazing how much you learn, how quickly you learn. And we are doing that not so that we're good at landing vertically, but so we understand the new and different risks when you don't have a runway that you're landing on. Um, and, and you learn a lot very quickly. Next slide. Uh, we have been working off the planet for quite a while on this little tiny thing called the International Space Station. There's a great picture of Raja who just came home on SpaceX Crew 3. Uh, he was the commander of that vehicle. Uh, our crew is up there right now, uh, Crew 4 with Chell and his crew, and, uh, and they're conducting science uh, day and night, 24-7, 365 days a year, and we've been doing this since the year 2000. And, and every day that I personally spent on the space station, I looked at it as walking on Mars. That is why we're up there. We're trying to make life better on Earth, and we're trying to expand humanity into our solar system. Next slide. Uh, this, this makes me jealous. Uh, one, of my, one of my classmates, Kate Rubens, is somewhere in that photo, uh, two-time flyer to the space station, a microbiologist, and, and we have her out in a, in a European training session just a few months ago called Pangea, where we're going out and looking at all lunar geology how we would sample rocks, how we would get lunar samples, retain them, catalog them for the scientists on Earth. Uh, what we need to think about is a totally different way of thinking in a geologic time scale um, and, a, and, and just thinking the way a geologist would think on the surface of the moon and, and onward to Mars. So we're doing that training. Uh, we also train a lot in Iceland. Uh, it is a very good analog to the lunar surface. Next slide. Uh, some of you this afternoon will go over to our virtual reality uh, laboratory, and virtual reality is just paying enormous dividends right now. So uh, we expect the, the next human landing on the moon to be at the South Pole. And if you've ever looked out at the moon at night, the South Pole has got a very weird, very weird sun angle, very weird light that hits it. There's permanently shaded regions. And we have developed, hopefully you'll see it this afternoon, we've developed in the, in the virtual reality world what it actually looks like with the exact sun angle that we'll be landing at. And it is crazy weird. The bottom half of you can be in absolute blackness and the top half of you can be in blinding sunlight. Uh, the way shadows are projected across the lunar surface, it just changes literally everything. So in this virtual reality world, we can go in there for 10 minutes and you can answer a thousand questions. You can stop 200 meetings with 10 minutes of VR goggles. And so it's, uh, it's really a great facility. I, th I think you'll like it. Uh, <laughs> all right, next slide. Uh, we also, over in Building 5 here at the Johnson Space Center, we have the Orion uh, crew trainer. Uh, there you have uh, Stephanie, Johnny, and uh, Randy Bresnik, who have been heavily involved in the development of Orion the last few years. Uh, what it'll feel like to fly, and that trainer is being outfitted right now and will be ready uh, later this year to start our crew training. Next slide. And uh, the final slide in this, uh, I think some of you were out this morning at our neutral buoyancy laboratory about 10 minutes uh, north of the Johnson Space Center. Uh, very large pool where we have been training for International Space Station spacewalks for two decades, and now we're taking a portion of that pool and looking at what it would look like to be on the moon uh, to spend six hours in a lunar class spacesuit 
doing research on the bottom of a pool. And it's, it's an amazingly fantastic facility um, to be underwater, to spend that much time thinking about how it will be to be on the moon. So we'll be using that as we move forward. Um, and that's, that's the end of my PowerPoint pitch. The question that everyone will ask is when are we assigning a crew to Artemis II? And uh, we hope that'll be later this year. Thank you. Very good. All right, thanks to all of our briefers for the very detailed uh, overview of the Artemis I mission and, and what it, we are doing for the future to build upon uh, uh, Artemis and going to the moon and to Mars. So we're extending our time for the, um, for the briefing to give us about 45 minutes for questions. Um, so we'll, we'll spend some time taking some questions here in the room and then, of course, on our phone bridge. Um, so a review of how we're going to take the questions. Uh, raise your hand nice and high so we can see you. And then we're going to run a microphone over to you and then you can ask your question with the microphone. We'll start over on this side. Uh, and then please state, uh, once you have the microphone, state your name, your affiliation, and uh, to whom you'd like to direct your question. We have folks from all over. Uh, so just uh, make sure you um, state to who you'd like to direct your question. Um, if you're on the phone bridge, please press star one uh, to submit your name into the queue. And then once your name is called, um, you can direct, direct a question to anyone here on the panel. And if you find that your question has already been answered, you can withdraw it at any time by pressing star two. Uh, so with that, let's start here in the room on this side. Please go ahead. Yeah, and we can start. state your uh, name, affi affiliation, and to whom you'd like to direct your question. Uh, Chris Gephardt with NSF. Uh, I believe they're for Judd. Um, in terms of ascent, um, with the launch abort system not having its, its abort motors installed, what abort options are available for Orion, and when do they become available in the ascent profile? And on the flip side of that, for landing, uh, when you're coming into San Diego, what if the weather isn't good at the landing site on October 10th? What are your options to target a different one? What are the backup landing options for, for the 10th? That's a great question, Chris. Uh, so uh, our abort options become available after the last jettisons. Uh, about, about that three and a half hour, uh, three and a half minute uh, mark. Uh, our first uh, abort mode that we have available to us is untargeted splash. So uh, that would be where we separate and, uh, and and splash down somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we also have an overlap between that untargeted abort splash uh, mode and then an abort once around uh, option. Uh, that's about seven and a half minutes or so into the flight where we have that uh, that um, uh, overlap. And the abort once around would take the uh, the, the the capsule and, and put us off the coast of uh, California, uh, in the Pacific. Um, additionally, we have um, once the solar rays are deployed uh, after about that uh, you know 18 plus 12 minute mark, uh, we have available to us should something go wrong with the upper stage, uh, we have the available uh, uh, option to abort to orbit. So we'll we'll do an orbit. Obviously, uh, we wouldn't be going in the moon in, in that fact. Uh, as far as your question on entry, uh, what, what options do we have uh, for abort landing for weather? Uh, once we do our deorbit burn back at uh, RPF, return power flyby, uh, our trajectory along the Earth's surface is fixed. Uh, so the only thing that we can do to modulate is to land a little longer than we intended or land, or sh land shorter than we intended. So uprange or downrange. And, uh, and so we have uh, several sites uh, within 1,200 1,200 nautical miles of San Diego that we'll be looking at uh, to make sure we can, and, and we're 90% confident that we'll be able to find one that, that will feed all, fit all the conditions that we need uh, to splash down. Uh, Melissa didn't mention this, but uh, three days out before splashdown, uh, her, her uh, recovery team is going to be halfway between that 1,200 nautical mile and, and, and San Diego. And so uh, once we have a better idea what the weather's going to be like, uh, we'll, we'll either send, send uh, the recovery forces inland, or if, uh, if the, the, the weather's bad inland, then we'll, they'll, they'll proceed outland. Okay, yeah. Hi, I'm... Is this working now? All right, hi, my name is John Moan. I'm a correspondent for Newsy. And again, apologies for the redundancy here. Once we get all the data from this unmanned mission, uh, what's a refined timeline for when human beings are going to be going back to the moon? Do you want to answer that? Or? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so after Artemis one, you know, the next step will be Artemis two, which is uh, planned for 2024. So that'll be our crewed mission. We'll take all the data from this flight. 
Um, the Artemis II, uh, you, you saw pictures of the European service module for Artemis II has already been delivered. The crew module and the launch abort systems are already well on their on way of being fabricated down at Kennedy as well. So um, we talked mostly about Artemis I today, but those vehicles are already rapidly being built. Um, plan to hand those over to our um, ground support friends in, in mid-2024 and launch by the end of 24 for crew. Um, as far as Artemis III targets in 2025, so we're trying to do annual missions after that. Um, it, it's out, kind of outside the scope of this briefing because there's a lot of other components that have to feed into that. But in terms of the Orion vehicle and the launch system, those are both targeted to be ready by then. Okay. Uh, Mark Caro with Aviation Week and Space Technology. And my question is for uh, Rick LeBroad. How, how will this mission inform mission control and the team uh, to prepare for the crewed flights, either um, two and three. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is, what will you guys be focused on um, to make sure that you've got the bases covered for when you have a crew? Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so right now, uh, all the performance data that we have of the vehicles really is test data. That, that Debbie talked about. Um, we supported the, all those tests, uh, but it's, it's all either test data or, or models, the, theory. And this mission is gonna inform all the models. It's, we're gonna see how the vehicle's gonna really, really perform in the environment that we're asking it to, to perform in. And so all that information is, is gonna be knowledge that we're gonna gain. We're gonna be updating all of our procedures and our documentation to, to, to make it more accurate as to how we how that vehicle is going to operate and that's just going to make us smarter controllers for when we uh, when it is time to put the crew on or on, on the vehicle Irene Klotz also with Aviation Week um, probably for Judd um, after the perigee raise maneuver um, how long before the TLI burn might there be to have Orion stay in Earth orbit if there's some issue and also what's the battery life on Orion before the solar rays uh, need, need to be deployed. Great, great questions, Irene. Uh, let's see. So, uh, first question on uh, perigee raise maneuver: How long can Orion stay uh, on board orbit if if there was a uh, on board uh, if there's a problem? Uh, so, if, if there's a problem with the upper stage, uh, Orion has still has the uh, the uh, uh, Ohms engine available to it, so we can we can circularize, we can raise its perigee if we need to on its own. So. It, we can perform a, 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 a an, an orbital insertion, although uh, in that case uh, we're likely not going to the, to the moon. Does that answer your question? Is it, or? No. If there's, um, if there's the can you pass the mic down? Thank you. If the upper stage is available, but some other issue comes up where you're not burning according to your nominal timeline, is there an option to um, delay the TLI burn? I understand your question now. Uh, no, there's no option. So uh, the uh, the upper stage is a pretty much a fire and forget uh, vehicle. Uh, so uh, if if it doesn't perform the perigee raise maneuver or if it doesn't perform the TLI maneuver, uh, Orion does not have the the uh, the commodities to to get to the moon by itself. So it has to be uh, put on that uh, TLI uh, burn by the upper stage, and and it has to be at the times that that we prescribe. Uh, your second question about the batteries, uh, how long do the Orion batteries last uh, before the solar rays? Uh, they can last about 45 to 50 minutes or a little bit in that hour time range, just enough to, to get to the abort once around should that be needed. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace. Uh, one for Rick and one for Reed. Um, Rick, is, is, I'm realizing there's no crew on board. Um, how how is the flight team going to be referring to the vehicle when it's in orbit over the loops? Is, does it have a call sign, um, or is it Orion, Artemis One, and for Reed, um, are there members of the astronaut corps who are assigned to specific technical roles for Artemis One, supporting either as a Cape Crusader or on reentry or uh, in mission control? Yeah, mine's easy. Uh, it is Orion. We'll refer to it as Orion. Um, mine is more complicated. Many of these people you know well. Uh, Stan Love will be working in mission control. He'll be following along as if we had a capsule communicator on on uh, on 
console. So Stan will be looking from mission control perspective. Uh, Randy Brezik has been following Orion on our technical side with the Orion program for the last few years. So he'll be looking at the technical aspects of the mission. Uh, Joe Acaba is our VIT chief. So he will be down at Kennedy Space Center looking at all of our processes leading up to the pad and then also on return. And then uh, I, will, I will also be at Kennedy for launch, looking at where will we be putting family, where will we be in launch control the day the crew is on board the vehicle. And I'll be there with our uh, flight ops director, Norm Knight, as we do that. That's, that's the small scale, but also understanding that this Artemis One mission gets everybody fired up. So there is a large press element. So you will see uh, astronauts uh, all over with the administrator. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of uh, interviews, especially I know this afternoon, a lot of folks will be touring you around uh, as, you're, as you're going through Johnson Space Center. So we'll be all over the place, but for the technical roles, those are really the folks we have assigned. One, one quick follow-up. Uh, so I, I said Orion, which that's what we'll call it. But you know, we do have the the crew module and the service module, and a lot of the systems are like there's a prop uh, system on both both modules. So we would then refer to it at the crew module or service module level. Uh, thank you, uh, Tarek Malik with Space.com. I, I believe I have uh, one for Reed and, and maybe one for Melissa. Reed, with some systems like the waste management, etc., not flying on Orion, I'm really curious what. Uh, the experience you're looking for for the astronaut corps to, to get from the sensors that are going to be on board the mannequins, et cetera, uh, in the spacecraft. How germane and how accurate uh, can you get a picture of what that experience is going to be like? And for Melissa on recovery, uh, with a, uh, an extended retrieval time for the testing, what's the target recovery for an actual crew that you're going to want to aim for? Thanks. Uh, from the crew on board standpoint, um, I got, I got to be honest, the thing I'm most looking for is how does this integrated system work? How does the core stage vehicle dynamics work on ascent? I know that will all be good. How does the uh, ablative block heat shield architecture work on reentry? Uh, that is something we'll be watching for the ride inside. We've been working on this vehicle for years. Uh, we've been doing egress training. Uh, we've been looking at the, the waste facility, the exercise facilities for years. That is not what we're looking to get out of Artemis One. This is a robust vehicle. It's built to go to deep space. Uh, it's going to be ready for crew when we are when we're ready to fly there on Artemis Two for sure. Yeah, I might add, you know, on Artemis One, we are flying, like I said, some some payloads that will help. Um, inform our models and make sure that the design that we have predicted is actually re realized during the flight. So, you know, the kinds of environments we're worried about radiation, vibration, accelerations, all those things we're measuring in the vehicle. Uh, the heat shield has hundreds of sensors embedded in this ab coat block. So we'll be collecting, you know, actual temperatures at, at actual locations, different depths, uh, different locations. Um, same thing with the, the landing loads. We've got sensors that are picking that up. So, so really, I think you know, in terms of crew protection and crew uh, occupancy, um, it's it's really about validating the design so that we're ready. These other systems like waste management, galleys, exercise, we do have a lot of those uh, capabilities to test on the ground. We have crew over all the time testing out those facilities. Um, if you're going to Building Nine later today, you'll see the mock-up, and there's uh, all of those those capabilities in there. Um, as well as um, the vehicle that we're building up now for Artemis II already has the waste management system has been installed for a year. So we, um, and, and in terms of that one specifically, that same waste management system has been flown to space station. So um, Reed mentioned about a lot of the stuff we do on space station informing our, our data. We, we use that as a test bed all the time to, to prove out the things like fluid dynamics you really want to test in zero gravity, right? So, so the waste management system is on board today. We did have another second question for Melissa. Let's go over to Melissa. Okay. Hi, that was a great question. So um, our requirements for getting crew to med bay is two hours. Um, I will tell you that our estimates think that we can beat that pretty significantly. We think we're looking at about um, 80 minutes. Um, I will tell you that, however, we, the capsule that you saw in the picture that we showed you does not have an interior. And the trainer that we're using to refine those egress procedures with the DOD and timing um, is almost finished. It's actually going through final stages of verification and validation. So as soon as Artist One is over, the very first underway test we will um, embark on with the Navy will have that new capsule that has a hatch and seats in it. And we will start refining how quickly we can get to the capsule, open the hatch, get the crew out, and get them to med bay on the ship. So um, estimate is 80 minutes at this time, but we think that that we can beat that and refine those procedures. Excellent. Let's go back in the room. Gina Sinceri, ABC News. I think this is for you, Rick. 
If you launch at 8.33 a.m., it's a 42-day mission. If your launch slips in that window, how does the mission duration change and why? Okay. Uh, actually, the mission duration doesn't change at all. Uh, it'll force our team to do a lot of replanning. Uh, but for the most part, the mission is, is identical. Um, that's the beautiful thing about uh, allowing for a two-hour launch window. It gives us flexibility for the launch teams uh, to successfully launch, um, and, and we can still execute the, the same mission. Uh, things, the burns, the primary burns may slide on the order of minutes, uh, but pretty much the, the mission will be exact, the exact same. And I'll add on to that. Uh, so the reason that's the, it's the same duration is every launch day we're targeting the same point in space for TLI, uh, translator injection, and so the, when we move through that window, we're just changing the angle at which the rocket is, is approaching that TLI, and, and actually that TLI is moving westwardly, uh, every, you know, throughout that that window. So we're we're changing the the, uh, the angle at which we're approaching. And at risk of getting way out over my skis, so okay. we're gonna we're gonna roll here. We have three launch attempts, right? We've got uh, the the 29th, I think, the second and the fifth, but. I think this is a, a really important point. We're flying this vehicle as a test flight. We do not know everything. We've modeled everything. We've evaluated everything. We've tested everything we can test on the ground. But it's a whole different ballgame when you roll to the pad and you go to get off of that pad. So there's, there's a very solid chance we roll, we go for the 29th, and we don't make the 29th. And there's a chance we don't make the second or the fifth. And in that case, then we're going to roll back to the VAB, we're going to reset a few systems, and we're going to go back out. That next set of three launch attempts, we do go to the shorter class 22, I think, day mission. So just, just keep in mind, there, there's a lot of unknowns still out there. So, yeah, so just make sure it's clear. So the 29th, the second, and the fifth are all long class. They're going to all be 40 plus day missions. Uh, then, but if we roll back and then we go into the next launch period, then we start off. Uh, the, it's generally the first part of the of the launch window, uh, which is several weeks, um, is a short class, and then we transition to a long class. Um, hi, uh, was this? Okay, uh, Bill Harwood, CBS News. I just want to follow up on on those last ones. Um, you know, we've all been told the 29th, 2nd, and 5th. Charlie Blackwell Thompson said last week or earlier this week. If you rolled out on the 18th, she said you get two attempts. Explain what's going on there. I don't understand the flight termination system better installed. When does that clock, that 20 day clock, if it is a 20 day clock, when does the 20 day clock start ticking? And if you roll out on the 18th, what's your last opportunity to fly? In other words, do you really get all three of those opportunities or not have A second question I'm squeezing in. I'm not standing in my driveway looking at it and going, that's good. No. That's a great question. I'll take the first and one. Uh, if the briefers can reiterate the question, we actually didn't capture that for TV. Okay. So just a quick, <laughs> quick reiteration and then answer it. Thank right. you. The, the first question that Bill had was, um, what, what is the actual constraint on the flight termination system, and where does the 20 days that, that Charlie Blackwell Thompson uh, uh, talked about come from? Uh, and, and, and where does the clock start? So the clock starts uh, during the processing in the VAB. Uh, that that window starts when they they do they install the FTFS batteries. Uh, they they charge them up. That's when the certification uh, period uh, or the, the starts at 20 days. So I, I I believe and I'm I'm not exactly sure the day that they're planning to do that. But that'll be around like the 16th or 17th, something like that. 20 days later. Uh, the range has 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 told them that uh, the the batteries are only certified for 20 days, and so I think that puts you right after uh, the the second, so like the third or fourth, uh, you know, right there, not quite to the fifth, uh, and so that's where you know how why she quoted uh, two days attempts, right? Because the the 20 day certification ends right on the the edge of of, of being able to pick up the fifth. I do know that uh, they are in talks with the range, the, the Eastern range, to try to extend that certification uh, to a little bit longer than 20 days, hopefully to bring in a third attempt, but those, those negotiations, negotiations are still in work. Uh, as far as your second question, um, yeah. I don't know, Rick, you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, your reference from standing on Earth watching it is very similar to what the Apollo uh, trajectories looked like in that it's, it's in a, the Earth-Moon plane. So as we fly by the, the Moon and do that outbound powered flyby, like it will be on the backside and we'll, we'll lose calm, calm with it and then it just goes up and we'll stay in that plane and it's doing a big orbit around there. So uh, when we do that big, that big orbit, the, that first six days, we're going to have a, a loss of calm for on the order of three hours. While because the the moon is blocking the the pathway to the to the Earth, so it's very similar to Apollo, just a lot lot far. They would go in lunar orbit, and we're going to be at that uh, that's just so distant Russia. Yeah, it it's, it all depends, but yes, probably. Hi guys, Tom Costello with NBC News. Thank you for a terrific briefing. Thank you very much. I had a couple of quick follow-ups. Uh, you had mentioned that there are two blackout periods on re-entry, and I, I'm blackout for comms. I'm curious why that is. Shuttle, as I understand, did not have any blackout periods. Uh, so what's changed? Is it the re-entry uh, position? Is it the speed? Why why two blackout periods on re-entry? And then the second one is uh, if there were to be a reason to abort on liftoff. Any chance at all of, of aborting to the space station, or is that not possible at all? Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, good questions. Uh, as far as the blackout period, uh, the uh, the orientation of the antennas, that's, that all has to do with why the shuttle didn't have the blackout. Uh, originally, early on in the shuttle program, there were blackout periods uh, until we, they were able to get uh, antennas on top of the shuttle to look up at the Teeter satellites. Uh, as far as the double blackout, it's just antenna orientation and there's lots of plasma coming around uh, you know the the, the vehicle the, uh, I believe the Soyuz is the same same <laughs> as the same issue right you know there there's a, a period of time where there's there's blackout due to, to the, the plasma field uh, as far as uh, your second question uh, no there's not it's not a possibility to abort to the, the space station it's not even anywhere near the, the same orbit okay uh, so Good, okay. Uh, Joanna Pinkward from Polish Public Television. Uh, the question will be for Reid. Uh, do the astronauts uh, from Artemis mission need some different training than uh, other astronauts who are uh, flying for the ISS or something like that? And how old are they? Uh, so the way I look at it is uh, right now we have 42 active NASA astronauts here. Artemis is an international program and we'll be flying uh, colleagues from uh, around Earth on this, on this vehicle as, as we move forward. Uh, right now, uh, every one of our astronauts is eligible for an Artemis mission. So if you get assigned to a space station mission, you go into a space station training track. If you're assigned to an Artemis mission down the road, you'll go into a very specific Artemis training track. While we're not assigned to those missions, we, I personally want our astronauts to be as well-rounded as po possible. Even though you may not walk on the moon, studying geology in Pangaea helps you when you're on the space station looking down at our Earth, looking at the geologic processes that you get to see for six months or a year when you're looking down. And the thing you never get with robotic missions are these eyes and this brain. And we can think up some crazy things when we are left to be a little bit bored. It's just amazing what you get to think about on the space station for six months when you look down at our beautiful planet and watch it orbit the sun and see how it changes. So uh, we're, I, I say we're all the same until you get assigned a mission and then you go into a specific training track. And for age, uh, we have anywhere from late 20s all the way up to mid 60s. And as long as you are healthy, there is there is a tiny bit of medical testing on us. Uh, as long as you are healthy, then we're going to load you in a rocket and shoot you off the planet. And walk on the moon. And walk on the moon. <laughs> and then on to Mars. Good morning, uh, Jeff Faust of Space News. Uh, Artemis One's flying the distant retrograde orbit, which is not an orbit that you're planning to use for future Artemis missions. I wonder if you can talk about some of the, the benefits and trade-offs of flying DRO versus the near rectilinear or halo orbit that you're gonna be using for Artemis Three and beyond. And also, the difference between the short and the long class missions, are there mission objectives that you would be able to achieve with a long class mission that you would not be able to achieve with a short class mission because of less time in the DRO? I'll, I'll take a shot at that one. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very focused on the Artemis One mission, so I don't have a lot of knowledge about the, the other Artemis missions. But I think the knowledge we'll gain from, you know, getting to the moon and getting to the, uh, getting back, that uh, how we're going to uh, build trajectories and burn plans to do that. 
Uh, and that's exactly what we're going to use once we get to the moon in order to get into these, these specific uh, orbits around the moon. So Artemis 1, albeit it's very different, from a, as you as you alluded to, uh, we'll still gain all the knowledge for how this vehicle is going to operate uh, as far as the burn plans and and targeting these special these special burns to put us in these different orbits once we get to the moon. Um, for your second question regarding the difference between the short class and long class, actually we will be able to accomplish all of our mission objectives on a short class mission. They're just um, they're just uh, they'll be closer closer together, but we will be able to accomplish all of them even on a 26 to 28 day. 28-day mission. The things we, the challenges we have to deal with is we have thermal constraints where we can go out of attitude uh, to do some of these activities. Um, uh, but once you go out of attitude, you're limited to three hours. And then once you come back into attitude, you have to be uh, tail to sun for 10 hours to get the thermal recovery before you go off and do another one. So to plan all these activities, these uh, events, to ensure that we can meet all the objectives, it's a very tightly choreographed timeline to ensure that we meet all uh, the thermal constraints. But uh, we've built timelines for the short class missions and we can meet all our objectives. And on the, the distant retrograde orbit, um, you know, it, it, because of the, the moon earth gravity interaction with that orbit, we can stay, that's very stable, it takes very little prop to actually stay in that orbit. So that's one of the advantages of being there. We can get a very long mission, really ring out the systems, whether it's a short class or a long class, it's going to be quite a bit longer than the first crewed flight, which is targeted 10 to 12 days, something like that. So, so we're getting this, this very long orbit. We can really bring out the systems without a whole lot of prop load just to stay there as part of it. And then looking forward for the NRHO uh, for Artemis II and beyond, uh, the advantage of that orbit is uh, that it's always facing the Earth, right? So you have uh, something that's always facing the Earth, uh, and uh, it'll allow... Uh, several different types of vehicle, whether it be Orion or the, the lander, uh, to, to, to rendezvous with the gateway uh, and then go to the, to the, to the moon surface. Dan Schaefer, Way 31. There you go. Dan Schaefer, Way 31 in Huntsville. This is a follow up for Reed on the astronauts. So you've called 40 odd astronauts now down to about 10 who want to fly on these first couple of crewed missions. How did you do that? Well, we have definitely not done that. So we have 42 active astronauts, and then earlier this year, some of you folks were here, we, uh, we announced our, our latest class of astronaut candidates with 10 Americans from across our country, all walks of life, to join our core, and they're in their initial training right now. When they graduate in about 18 months, then they'll come into uh, the, the 42 active astronauts with us. Uh, right now, we are looking, truly, that we have not made any flight assignments. We have not necked down who is going to do what missions at this point in time. We want to watch Artemis 1, um, and then we want to make the right smart decision uh, when we assign 2, and then eventually 3 and beyond. Thank you so much. Roseanne Aragon with KPRC. Thank you so much for making time for us. I have two questions. Uh, the first is for Reed. Uh, we know the Apollo generation is watching, and this means so much to them. What is your message to those who worked on the Apollo program and how their expertise contributed to what you're working on today? Uh, what I would say to them is thank you. Uh, that Apollo generation landed humans on the moon at a period where I truly look back and think it was impossible. Um, and then that technology, the, the very Johnson Space Center that we're sitting at right now is a legacy of the Apollo era. Um, but I don't think about that when I think about Apollo. When I think about Apollo, I think about every kid that watched that landing and wanted to work in mission control, that wanted to be an astronaut, that wanted to be a doctor, that wanted to be a school teacher. Like the impact of what Apollo did was not putting Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon. It was changing the way we look at STEM completely. There is, you know, there is nothing that motivates someone more than doing. And that is what Apollo did, and that is what Artemis is going to do. We are going out there, and we are going to do this. And that way, you really energize uh, everyone. My second question is a, a more of a technical question. I see a lot of big mission objectives here, testing the guidance and navigation control, um, seeing how the orbital maneuvering system does, um, making sure you nail the return power flyby. What is your margin of error, uh, especially considering some of these things have never been done to this capacity at all? What's your margin of error and what does success look like if not all of your objectives is met? Okay, uh, well, <laughs> the margin error is, is small, but those trajectory correction maneuvers that I'm talking about, uh, they, um, 
they're what are going to ensure that when we fly by the moon, we're at the right altitude and we don't run into it. Um, and, and I talked about uh, the burns. Uh, we, we assign a criticality to them. So uh, a non-critical burn is one. If we didn't execute it, uh, no harm, no foul. We can pick it up. We can make it up later. Uh, then we have um, mandatory burns where if you don't execute that burn, then you lose a mission objective. A good example would be the outbound powered flyby. So uh, if we didn't do that, then we wouldn't be able to get up to the DRO and, and do the DRO mission. Uh, we'll still safely bring the, uh, Orion back, um, but we won't be able to accomplish all of our mission objectives. And then the last category is the critical burn. That's the return power flyby, and that's the one, if we don't execute it, then it's a loss of the vehicle. Um, so uh, the margin in air is small, but we have, we have opportunity to make sure that we uh, correct, make all the right corrections to make sure that we target our outbound power flyby and our return power flyby. Uh, so uh, confident that we'll be able to uh, execute the trajectories as, as necessary to, as long as the vehicle performs the way it's designed, we're, we're going to get the mission accomplished. And I would add to that that, I mean, this is a test flight. So uh, we're also finding where the margins are, right? We're finding where the conservatism in, in, in the, uh, the analysis that we've been previously done. And so, so in many respects, we're continuing to learn, right? And so we'll find where those margins are. Hi, I'm Cooper Heim with Singularity and Everyday Astronaut. Um, Apollo had Hasselblad as the camera on the moon. And I'm curious to know, um, does Artemis have a camera? Actually, Artemis has a lot of a lot cameras. Of <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Debbie probably could talk better to the internal ones, but on each of the solar array wings, we have we have a, a GoPro uh, that wireless has a wireless link to the to the crew module, and we'll be taking imagery uh, a lot throughout the entire mission, and we'll be uh, transferring that imagery from the from the GoPro Go, GoPro camera down to the uh, we have camera controllers internal to see them, and then we'll be bringing those down uh, down to the earth. But there's internal cameras also that. I don't know the, the make of those, do you know? Yeah, I don't know the make. There are several cameras, cameras inside the crew module, and actually there's a, a technology demonstration payload being flown called Callisto. You can read about it if you haven't already. Um, it's a, co a, a collaboration with Alexa, and actually, so you'll have a, yeah, you'll have a camera on board. You'll be seeing, you know, from a, the vantage point of a crew member sitting in a seat, and actually participants can interact with um, that if you have Alexa at home, you can ask questions. Where's Artemis today? Where's Orion today? What's happening on the mission today? So there are there are various camera views, both externally. You know, some of that's imagery you want to capture for post-flight analysis. Did things perform the way we want, or did that solar array deploy and lock into place? So definitely, definitely the cameras external help us during the mission if we start seeing an, an data that looks like an anomaly. Um, but then a whole bunch of video inside too as well for for just yeah see what's going on. Is that the same for whenever they go down to move up the most of GoPro? Will that be Red, red, yeah, good question. Those are Artemis three related, so I wouldn't be able to get to the answer today. I'm sure Gary can get you some information on what's happening on those. Mm -hmm. I might sneak a cell phone. <laughs> They're pretty good cameras. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Over here, Daniel Pons from The Independent. Uh, a lot of people ask questions about numbers and mathematics and specifics, and I want to talk about the human aspect. Uh, this is the very first time that we see an African-American, a woman, getting into the moon. Uh, Diana Trujillo from Colombia being the flight director. Uh, astronauts from Ecuador origin, from Salvador, from Puerto Rico. How important was for NASA to send that message out there, that this was like driving into diversity and inclusion, all of you guys? That's double. Absolutely a priority. I mean, it, it's just it's something we think about every day. And so, you know, it, this mission to me, I, professionally, I'm very excited and proud. But I also personally, I have three kids, two of which are daughters. And so when I talk to them about we're going to send a woman to the moon, they, they came to understand what, but there hasn't been one. Like it's like so they grow up in an environment where things are just so much more diverse and inclusive. So, so absolutely to me, from a professional, but also from a very personal standpoint, I think it's a huge, huge deal that that, that we've made this a, a very big focus of this mission for both women and people of color yeah absolutely I, it, that that's our job at nasa is to do the things that are difficult and to do the things that are right and to motivate our base which is our youth and right now our country is a is a diverse and extremely rich country and we want our astronaut corps to look, we want every kid in America to look at our poster and say, oh, I see myself in that. Uh, I grew up poor, or I grew up in this state, or I grew up with this type of family. I, I want to, I can do that someday. And it's really important for 
all of us to stand together as we go and do this. And the, the neatest part about getting to work at the Johnson Space Center and at NASA as a whole is the team you work with. Every day when you get to work, the, the stories you can tell, the, the flight director class that we just hired that's truly from all over our country and the world, it is an amazingly rich place to work. And I, it's reflected every year. It's the, it's the best government agency to work in, and, and there's a reason for that, because we're a bit progressive and we really love what we do. All right, I'm going to go to the phone for a second. They've been very patient, uh, so I just want to make, give them an opportunity as well. Marvin Marshall with the Nighttime News Space Report. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Marvin Marshall from the Nighttime News Space Report. I appreciate you guys having having us out here today. Um, now, um, my question kind of uh, banks on the camera uh, the, the camera question there. You know, I was wondering, you know, how much public engagement will there be? Does it mean the live streaming from orbit? You know, pictures are worth a thousand words, but you know that video just does so much more for us. Now, will, will there be like an emphasis on providing the public with live streams after the launch live stream? Uh, you know, on orbit, and, you know, that initial live stream and you know, like on Artemis 1 or even Artemis 2. And thank you for taking our questions. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer that. Uh, if, I, if I heard it correctly, and if I didn't, you can ask again when, we're, when I'm finished. But, um, yes, throughout the mission, we will be having live stream uh, imagery coming down. Uh, but it's in competition with all the data that we need to get down as well. Uh, we, we are limited on our data rates that we'll be transmitting uh, information down from, the, from Orion uh, throughout the mission. Uh, there's periods where we'll go to a high day rate, uh, where we'll be able to do imagery and then also keep uh, maintain our telemetry. Uh, but uh, for a lot of these events, we'll also be uh, recording the, the high resolution imagery, and then those would be downlinked uh, after the after the event. Um, we have a, a priority list of how we're going to bring uh, files off of the off of the uh, Orion. So it's it's going to take a matter of time because there's a lot of data that we'll be bringing down on a, on a continuous basis. Uh, so it'll be after uh, somewhat after the event to get the real high res. But the intent also is to have some streaming uh, imagery throughout the uh, during these events as well. And let's go to let's go to Melissa real quick. So uh, she wants to add a little bit about what happens at the recovery phase for imagery. Go ahead, Melissa. Awesome, thank you. Yes, yeah, so we have about 17 cameras all over the ship in helicopters in the open water. Uh, several of those are connected to a, um, a basically a satellite system that we have on board that we will be able to stream near real time live video back to Johnson to be um, sent over NASA TV. So we will, you will be able to see um, recovery operations real time. Very good. Let's also go to the phone. Last one on the phone, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Uh, yes, hi. Um, Fareed, I was hoping you could provide some details, please, on what special traits or skills you're looking for for the first two crews. And, and will the first two crews come from the 18 Artemis team astronauts announced, announced a couple years back or not necessarily because today you seem to be indicating that any of the 42 active astronauts could be in the running at this point for Artemis 2 and 3. Thanks so much. You bet, Marsha. Uh, I'll start with the second half, which is... Um, the, the way I look at it, any, any one of our 42 active astronauts is eligible for an Artemis mission. We want to assemble the, the right team for this mission. As for what we're looking for in these first few Artemis missions, but I would say it's really what our astronaut corps is as a whole right now. Uh, first and foremost, technical expertise, the ability to dive into literally any situation any technical need of the vehicle to understand when things aren't going quite right and to understand when they are, that is, that is absolutely number one. Uh, and then beyond that, it is, are you a team player? Are, are you engaging? Can you work with our flight directors? That is exactly what our astronaut corps is today. We, we pride ourselves on long duration space flight, six months to a year on the International Space Station. We pride ourselves on, um, we call it expeditionary behavior uh, of being a good teammate, of uh, emptying the trash can when it's full, cleaning out the dishwasher when your parents ask you, those sorts of things. And, and that is really what we're looking for in those first Artemis missions. Technical expertise, team player, and, uh, and that's what we want. Very good. Let's go back in the room. Florian Meyer with ARD, German Radio Television. Thank you for doing that. Um, I wondered if there are, since you made it clear that Artemis 1 is about collecting as much data as possible, are there any moments or points throughout the mission where you're going to push the SLS, SLS the Orion closer to the limit than you would normally do when humans are on board? Um, I would say 
probably not to any extreme events. Um, we have, you know, most of our testing on the ground covers those extreme corners. So when I talk about like parachute testing, a lot of parachute testing with a drogue out or a main out, what happens when that happens. So we try and catch the corners of the boxes through our ground testing. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're looking, but, but we use that ground testing to build models on how the system's going to perform across all environments. So, so really during the mission, we're capturing the data. So we say, what environment did we really fly in? And then um, did that, the response, you know, in that environment, did the thermal and the pressures and the temperatures or the, the vibrations or, or whatever we're collecting, did it match the model predictions that we have based on all of our test data? So um, that's where I think we are. I think there probably are some operational things that we'll be a little more aggressive about because we don't have a crew and, and our number one objective is to get the heat shield data, right? So there might be, let's go for TLI, which we maybe wouldn't have been the call if you had crew on board, but because that is our primary objective, absolutely, you know, we might take a little more, um, I will not say risk, but, you know, a little more flexibility there, but I'll let to yeah, so Rick Tarnas. I think it's, it's a good point. Um, we established a philosophy on uh, at the planning stages of this mission that we would accept more risk. So. Um, during the uh, during the uh, the Leo phase, the low Earth orbit phase, before we do that translunar injection, if Orion s sustained a uh, failure that it rendered it zero fault tolerant to being able to recover safely recover and retrieve the uh, the capsule, uh, we're we're going to lean forward and we're going to press and we're going to execute the translunar injection just so we can uh, achieve the number one mission objective that getting that heat shield data. Um, while we get that, we'll also be able to pick up uh, most of the other ones as well. We'll be able to operate the vehicle in space. We'll uh, be able to, uh, Melissa and her team will be able to get on site and recover it. Um, you know, because uh, what we'll do is we'll burn the translunar injection and then we'll, we'll uh, select a, an early return trajectory to bring Orion back quickly. We won't make it to the moon. Uh, we may do a lunar flyby depending on the nature of the failure, um, but uh, that, that is, is so we can get that number one priority uh, objective and then safely get the, the, the vehicle back. And then on the SLS side, um, we don't have automatic aborts. So we'll have automatic aborts that, uh, uh, for the crewed vehicle. Uh, so they're all manual aborts at this point. So that's we're leaning forward in that, that aspect for the SLS as well. And I guess one other item, Melissa may want to jump in. Um, after the reentry and splashdown, uh, you know, she, she mentioned that they have up to two hours from a requirement standpoint to, to, to get the capsule in. Obviously, I think we're going to beat that. But I think on Artemis 1, we are doing leaving it in the water for two hours. We're doing a thermal soak back. We want to understand what is that thermal environment inside the capsule when we finally have crew in there on Artemis 2. Did we predict correctly? Because they're going to be in suits. You know, how long can they stay in suits and stay cooled? So, so in, in a case like that, we are pushing you know, beyond what we expect on the mission just to collect the data again to validate the design. Yeah, let's go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, Joey Roulette with Reuters. Um, if I remember correctly, there's going to be two mannequins that are female and two that are male on Artemis 1. Um, and I guess this is for Debbie or Reed. Is there a difference between how um, astronauts respond to radiation uh, on, the, on the capsule? And if so, how and what um, changes will you make to either the spacecraft environment or the spacesuit, if, you know, depending on the results? Um, so it was, I think, um, and, and I'm not fully up to speed on all the payloads, but I, there is uh, one full mannequin called Munikin Campos. It was a, a naming contest that, that happened several months ago. And then there's these two called Phantoms, which are just torsos. Um, one's going to be wearing a radiation protection vest and one is not, so kind of comparative. Um, you know, radiation does affect women obviously differently than men. I don't know if there's something else from the crew standpoint you want to mention, but, but we're collecting the data to understand did the protection of the vehicle provide what we expected. So we, we, we used to have, uh, <clears throat> I won't call them draconian, but maybe I said the word, some, some radiation limits that were definitely different for men and, de and different for women. And we have worked very hard through our agency, and we've got some outstanding leadership at headquarters right now, uh, and we have equalized all radiation limits. It does not matter whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, it is the exact same. And our end goal is, uh, you know, the United States of America is half men, half women. Well, space should be at least that. And so if we cannot make these spacecraft equitable uh, and we can't fly any type of person on them, then we need to look at our systems and reevaluate. So from where we stand, uh, there's absolutely no difference. Last question. Uh, yeah, Scott Johnson with Spaceflight Insider. Um, <clears throat> I think the rollout is about 13 days away, and then hopefully we have a launch in about 24 days. Uh, are there currently any issues being worked on the vehicle in the VAB that would affect either of those two dates? Um, I can speak from a Ryan perspective. Um, the answer is no. We are ready to go. The vehicle's powered down. I think today we're closing the hatches in a couple of days. 
um, to prepare for rollout. When it gets out to the pad, the hatches are opened again for some other late load um, items. But from a Ryan standpoint, we, you know, we have some minor what they call non-conformances when we process the vehicle at Kennedy. Um, but it's things like you know touching up little paint or things here. So no, nothing right now on our list that's withhold that's holding us up. Um, we just completed our J JSC Center Director pre-FRR pre-flight readiness review yesterday and successfully passed that. So we're good to go. I, I don't I can't speak for the rocket. I don't know if you guys yeah, have more. I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, issues on the rocket uh, that they're working at this time. And we'll go to Melissa to talk recovery ops. Hey, hey, I was just going to comment on the question. You know, I am here at Kennedy. I do share a wall with um, Cliff, who is the uh, the one who's getting us ready to roll out. Um, I could tell you that we, at this time, are not working any showstoppers. I can't give you any technical details on any of the nonconformance we have, but but we're looking pretty good right now for holding both of those dates. All right, that'll wrap up our time for questions. Thank you all for submitting your questions and to our briefers for uh, taking the time uh, to do a detailed brief of the Artemis One mission. Uh, you can follow more about the mission on nasa.gov slash Artemis dash one. Uh, all these charts that you saw uh, during today's briefing will be available online, so we can point you in the direction if you're interested in those. Thanks again for joining us. That'll wrap up today's briefing.